I know that's not, that's not necessarily true for everyone. However, what I hope to be able to give you tonight is kind of enough of an overview that if someone says, what's this property of your biochar or how if you need to make a decision between one versus another you'll have enough information to at least go find the properties that you're looking for find the right characteristics find the tools that you need to make an informed decision about what types of biochar to use and why so the the reason i think that that this is really relevant for this audience is is talking about valuation of biochar how do we value biochar now I did a quick uh, Google shopping search of biochar and, and found what I could buy in terms of a, a regular consumer if I went into say Home Depot or Target. And the cost of a biochar ranges anywhere from $20 to about $50 per cubic foot on the market about $1,000 to $2,000 per ton. Now, how did someone arrive at that? And what makes something more valuable than another? Why should I pay more for something than another? And the key, I think, to doing that is knowing what's in it and knowing what that stuff, what properties that stuff has. So to give you two examples, I picked this one right off the Home Depot website. So biochar blended with all natural fertilizer. And this is the description that they give us. And this biochar is made from buckthorn in a kiln. And then they add their own organic fertilizer so what looks like you're buying biochar, if you don't stop to read the, the fine print here, is actually one quarter by mass of a biochar and the remainder of coffee skins. So if you wanted that, that's great, but this isn't necessarily what I would call biochar. Now I went and found another one, and this one is a biochar that's made um, entirely from pine wood, and it has very different properties. You can kind of see even just the picture of the sizes here, the, the grains are slightly bigger. Um, it has more kind of surface morphologies to it. And just looking at the color, it's more black. So I would say this is biochar and I would say the other one is a mix of something that's biochar and a waste carbon material. Now, how do you know which one to pick? How do you know which one's better? Well, not all biochar is equal, okay? They have varying properties based on the feedstock as well as the processing conditions. And we, we can group these properties into physical properties. So things like the surface area or how porous something is, how much moisture it, it intrinsically holds, what's its density, can it withstand compression and compaction, what's its physical particle size? Am I talking about a fine powder or something that looks more like the size of uh, shredded wood chips? Then we go on to things like chemical properties, the pH, electrical conductivity, the composition, whether it has a lot of ash in it, um, whether it has a lot of volatile carbon, a lot of fixed carbon, the nutrients that are present. Um, is it thermally stable? And then we also have biological properties. So things like its biological oxygen demand and will it, is it, does it have toxic things in it that can prohibit microbial growth? Um, will it actually allow seeds to germinate in it? So all these things go into how we assess a biochar. And I'm gonna put a disclaimer out there. We do this stuff every day in our lab. This is what we do. We make a lot of different biochars. We make upgraded activated carbons um, and we work on it from a research standpoint. So our, our laboratory at Cornell, what my students do, um, is very reproducible and we're constantly calibrating our equipment and we're trying to do things that are standardized throughout the literature. Unfortunately, there are actually very few standards that exist to characterize biochar um, in the literature and they're varied. And the values that you get sometimes depend on the laboratory and the technique used. And I'll give you an example of that. And of course, kind of why do we see so much variation sometimes? Well, biomass itself, as you all know, is very heterogeneous. You know, the, sure, a pine tree can be a pine tree, and I'm pretty sure I have the same species growing three of them outside of my window and they were planted at the same time. But I guarantee if I cut them apart and I made biochar from them, I see different porosities and different um, volatile matter content depending on where I sampled from which tree. Okay, so 
a disclaimer here is that not, not everyone is doing something wrong if they come up with a different value for your biochar, but these are difficult things to actually measure and to standardize. So the, the efforts towards standardization, there are a number of them. There are one space just in the US, an international biochar initiative, as well as um, efforts within the scientific community to standardize things. I've chosen this one from the International Biochar Initiative to go through um, because it's one of the ones that, that we use frequently in our laboratory in terms of test categories. And the IBI, International Biochar Initiative, will certify a biochar if you have basic properties meeting um, certain categories that are physical, chemical, and biological in nature. So there are three test categories with IBI. The first one is kind of basic stuff. The next one is, is it toxic? Will it kill my plants? And the third one is more advanced analysis in terms of soil and enhancement. And those are optional. So I'm gonna go through these uh, characterization techniques based on these different test categories. But obviously they're not the only ones and I'm not saying I support IBI, this is just an example. So category A tells us that we have to measure these things and we have certain values for some and others are just reported. Um, so proximate analysis, basically what we're getting is our content of moisture, ash, and the types of carbon present. Ultimate analysis, which is going to give us how much elemental carbon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, oxygen is present. Then the pH. Uh, liming if the pH is above seven, electrical conductivity, and the particle size distribution. So let's dig into these. Proximate analysis, the way the International Biochar Initiative says that it should be done is through this standard test method, where a sample is representative of the lot of the biochar and it's placed in a crucible like this. And in the first step, the crucible is left open and it's heated in a muffle furnace like this to about 105 degrees C. And it's heated until it's at constant mass. And the amount of mass lost is equal to the water. There's very little, not none, but little matter left in the biochar at this point that's going to devolatilize or pyrolyze further if the sample is at 105 degrees. It's, if it's biochar and it's been pyrolyzed, it's certainly been well heated beyond that point. So everything that's lost at this point to 105 is moisture. The next step is the, the sample that's now dry is covered and it's put into the um, furnace again, and it's heated to 950 degrees. And the mass loss here is what we call volatile matter. And this is the kind of organic carbon that's present, the carbon that's either bound to hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or maybe sulfur. And then the last thing that we do is after we've measured the mass loss to determine our volatile matter is we uncover the sample and we again heat it, but this time it's exposed to the air that's in the furnace. And the mass that's lost is fixed carbon or oxidizable carbon, the carbon that's left that can burn. And the mass remaining is loosely termed ash, okay, the things that cannot burn. Now, this is where IBI and I start to disagree. Um, this is a standard test for measuring it. However, um, why we don't use this in our lab? Well, here's kind of a, a, um, a set of results from heating in the muffle furnace for um, some Phragmites and some wood chips that were made into biochar. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variation among each test run and for each time duration. And, so we, we think the reason that this happens is that, as you can imagine, even if you put a lid on the crucible, there's probably some air left in there and, and that volatile matter is still gonna burn. So what we do in our lab is we use a thermogravimetric analyzer. And this is basically a, a oven that has a balance inside of it where we can really precisely control the gas atmosphere that's present. So what we do is, again, we heat our sample up to 105 um, inside this oven, and we're constantly flushing it with nitrogen gas. So there's no oxygen present to actually burn any part of the sample. And again, the mass lost at 105 is our moisture content. We then heat our sample up 
we usually go to about 850 or 900 degrees Celsius, and we do this in nitrogen. And that loss is the volatile matter. We're essentially repyrolyzing our biochar, remaking our biochar. So you can, you can kind of imagine if the biochar itself was made around 600 degrees Celsius, we won't see a lot of mass loss um, before 600, we'll see a lot after that. And then this whole time, our entire instrument is being purged with nitrogen gas. So we're really just losing volatile matter. And then you can see this little dotted box down here. Um, we switch the gas atmosphere to air and we have a very, very rapid oxidation and that mass loss is our fixed carbon and what's left is our ash. So when you're asking someone for approximate analysis, um, you can either use kind of a muffle furnace method or a thermogravimetric method. Um, we think ours is a little bit more accurate. And for the um, determination of carbonate content of the soils, so if we, if we take our biochar and we expose it to an acid like hydrochloric acid, if there's carbonate in there, um, the acid plus the carbonate will react like kind of back to baking soda chemistry here and CO2 will be evolved. And we can calibrate a really simple um, instrument with a pressure gauge over it to determine how much um, carbonate is reacted or how much CO2 is produced um, by relating the pressure to the mass. So that's how we determine the mass of say um, calcium carbonate that's present. So we know what our inorganic carbons look like if they're carbonates. And kind of the last of this set of basic characterizations would be an ultimate analysis or an elemental analysis. We do this usually by um, a combustion analyzer where a sample of the biochar that has a known weight is put into an instrument where it's flow, where oxygen gas is flown over it and it's allowed to combust in that. And a chromatograph will measure the concentrations of our elemental carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We can add sulfur to that if we want, and we do oxygen by difference. So this is, this is kind of a really cool way to, to blow up a piece of our sample to figure out the elemental composition that's present. Now, why do these things matter? Why should we care about this proximate and ultimate analysis? Well, they tell us a few different things about how a biochar might behave when it's in used as a soil amendment or for other applications such as like drinking water treatment. Um, the ultimate analysis, so the elemental analysis, really helps us figure out when physical degradation might occur via dissolution. So if we have a lot of water running through our sample constantly, um, if we have, um, if we have a biochar that has a high ratio of oxygen to carbon and a low hydrogen to carbon ratio, it will tend to dissolve as it keeps getting saturated with the water. Um, and for the proximate and the organic carbon content, the IBI classifies biochar based on this organic carbon content. And so they'll say call class one something that has greater than 68% organic carbon. And you can kind of see um, what these, uh, this um, figure down here by uh, Johannes's group, I believe he spoke on Tuesday, showing us how the fixed carbon to ash to volatile ratio will start changing based on the feedstock and the pyrolysis conditions, okay? And what we find is that if we have almost too much volatile matter content and it comes off very quickly in our TGA, we, we tend to think that the biochar is unstable it's thermally unstable. And what we tend to see is that it reacts very quickly uh, with things in the soil. So we look for something that is around about 60% um, for, our, for our biochars. Things that are much higher, we actually tend to use as activated carbons. So other measurements that we take, um, we do pH and electrical conductivity. This is a pretty standard measurement. It's actually one you could do quite easily with like a $10 pH meter. Um, you mix a one part biochar to 20 part deionized water. If you don't have DI water, that's fine. You just measure the pH of whatever water you have. Um, and you mix those together and you allow them to equilibrate for at least 90 minutes. We put them on a shaking table to make sure that they're really well mixed. And then we allow the biochar to settle. We'll usually actually um, centrifuge it to make sure it's all gone. And then we measure our pH and our electrical conductivity. And I think uh, most people on this call can tell me better that pH and surface, um, the basic nature of the surface tend to increase with pyrolysis temperature and that can have some serious soil implications. 
Also, the salinity and electrical conductivity of biochars tend to increase with pyrolysis temperature. And how do you know if something is pyrolyzed at a, a higher temperature, um, other than the pH and your salinity tend to increase, um, it tends to look um, more black. So the, the higher carbonization you go, the more graphitic it looks, the black, more black it looks. So those things are all kind of correlated. So category B, um, things that are in here are our germination inhibition assays, um, our measurements of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, dioxins and furans, polychlorinated biphenyls, as well as a range of heavy metals. And these, um, well, the, the last four, I should say, all are based on EPA methods for measuring these types of chemical compounds. So I think the germination inhibition one is my student's favorite one. Um, most, most papers these days will recommend uh, using uh, different lettuce species. We tend to use an arugula um, in our germination assessments because they're pretty sensitive. And the IBI says that results should be reported as fail if the seedling does not germinate in our biochar blend soils, but it does in the unamended soils, and pass if there's no difference in germination between biochar blends um, or if blends are preferred. Now, the, the literature, of course, is, is quite interesting because everyone uses their own weight percent of biochar. You want to use one weight percent amendment, five weight percent, 10 weight percent. Um, so we, we tend to run a different kind of a, a variety so that we can see what the, what the actual impact is of the biochar on our germination. Um, we also as a lab tend to germinate as well, at least a few in just biochar. Uh, this is the test that IBI says has to be run. Our group also tends to take the seedlings that we get and measure the following. So IBI says uh, we need to measure the organic content, such as the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are present in the biochar. Why? Well, the 16 that are on the EPA's priority pollutant list are known carcinogens. So we should probably know whether or not it's in our biochar. And what we do to, to get this, this measurement is we take the biochar and we extract it with solvents, organic solvents that are known to pull these types of compounds out of the biochar. And then we inject the solvent that we've extracted into a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And basically it's the gas chromatograph separates the compounds that are present so that we get um, what we call a spectrum or a chromatogram, excuse me, um, based on time. So the picture here of the gas chromatogram that shows all different labeled peaks um, as a function of time is just a mixture that was separated. And for an example, peak eight is our anthracene, one of the EPA priority pollutants that we care about. And um, this at the bottom is the mass spectrum of the anthracene. Um, and the reason you see a peak at 178, if you remember back to your high school chemistry, that's the molecular weight of 178 anthracene. So that's why you see the primary peak there. So this you can imagine takes quite a bit of time and skill to do these types of measurements. Um, for every analyte, for every PAH we wanna measure, every PCB, um, everything we do, we have to calibrate our instruments for that. Um, so the reason that we wanna do these is obviously if they were to get into the soil, um, leave the biochar, go into the soil, and they could potentially migrate into plant life um, or be touched by people touching the soil, um, is kind of a twofold issue because it's not clear if biochars are actually able to release these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or polychlorinated biphenyls, um, or if they sequester them. And um, a few groups have done some work that really tries to understand whether or not um, the biochar kind of sequesters it. So potentially we could add biochar to soil and the soil um, will give up any pHs or PCBs it has in it and go into the biochar, or is the question the other way around, the biochar releases some of these? And that's a debate right now going on in the science that, well, at least our group hopes to help address. So that's the organics. The inorganics, um, everything from our heavy metals for our, to our nutrients, we take the biochars and we have to digest them in nitric acid and then take the digested sample and run it into some sort of an uh, elemental analyzer for, for metal compounds. 
we use an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer for ours. And basically the, um, the sample gets put into a plasma torch, uh, fourth state of matter and blows everything to bits. And we look at the signals and the signals tell us what metals we have and the strength of the signals tells us the concentration of what we have in there. So we tend to look at things um, like magnesium, manganese, potassium, uh, calcium, and then of course the heavy metals for any contamination is what we're looking for as well. And not only do we do this on our biochar, but we actually do this on those seedlings that we germinated to understand if any of the metals that were present in the biochar actually made their way into the plants that we were germinating. So implications of these, of these elemental analysis, well, um, of course, if we have a good distribution of nutrients in there and we're amending our soil with this biochar, we may well improve soil fertility. Of course, it could go the other way, depending on what's there. Um, certain microbial populations and processes are obviously mediated by different species. So we need to be careful about what we're doing there. Um, and really in terms of uh, human health implications, why we worry about this, of course, is if, um, especially if a child comes along and ingests um, some of our soil or biochar that might have had say lead in it or too high levels of selenium, we're looking at uh, definitely developmental issues. So we wanna make sure that our biochar is free of uh, potential health implications. Other things that impact this that start getting really fun in the lab. Um, of course, the elemental analysis and the pH play together to determine our cation exchange capacity. Um, and then depending on the pH um, and the types of functional groups that are present on our biochars, we can actually start chelating metals so we can bind our metals to biochar. So there's always the potential, depending on the pH and the types of groups of our biochar, that we could remove nutrients from the soil and sequester them into the biochar. So the last category that we worry about, this category C, um, are kind of optional tests are the um, available nitrogen present, which we do um, via spectrophotometric method, um, the phosphorus and potassium present, uh, the available phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and then the volatile matter as I described and surface area. And the surface area measurement is, is actually a pretty cool one where we basically take the biochar sample and we, in our lab, we do both heat and vacuum. We essentially clean it really, really well so that all the, the pores that are in the biochar, all those sponge-like um, kind of fixtures in there um, are cleaned out and evacuated. And then we measure the weight. And um, then we measure kind of the dead volume. So just what our tube volume has in it. And then we vacuum it out again to clean it again. And then we push nitrogen into the pores of the biochar and we actually measure um, the amount of nitrogen that gets taken up by our biochar's pores. And that tells us the surface area that's in there. And this is really important, a surface area, because it really does influence so many aspects of soil fertility. We're talking about ability to hold water in pores, um, to be uh, act as aerations. Um, helpful in terms of nutrient cycling, the more surface area has something has bigger pores, it tends to allow for um, more sequestration and storage of nutrients. Um, things that we look for are the kind of not only how much surface area, but also the size of those pores, how little or big they are. Really big pores, the things that you can see that make it look like a sponge, those we call macro pores, and those are obviously important um, for root movement for plants, microbial habitats. The micropores, the things that your eyes can't see but our scanning electron microscope can, um, those are important for like molecular transport, um, electronic transports and nutrient storage. So that's why we do this measurement and, and we, we wanna know both how much is there in terms of surface area and what size of pores are giving us that. So kind of beyond that, there are a lot of other potential properties that could impact our commercialization of biochar, including things like density um, for obvious shipping purposes, but also um, how much weight you need to add per soil. Um, if you want to make a fuel out of it, obviously calorific value. Um, adsorption capacity, we often look at would our materials be good to adsorb contaminants from water, just like a Brita filter. Um, how stable are they? We do both thermal and chemical stability measurements. 
um, because that tells us something about how well they're going to weather. We look at biological oxygen demand and others also look at um, kind of the cumulative respiration that the biochar changes in terms of the soil. So just kind of as an example for an adsorption capacity, we would take um, a known amount of biochar and expose it to a model contaminant for a known period of time and measure how much and how fast our biochar can remove that contaminant from water. And why do we care about that? Well, um, adsorption really governs the bioavailability and the fate and transport of, of chemicals. So this would be important for ag chemicals. Um, a lot of us are looking at ways that we could make um, spill release long-term fertilizers by putting nutrients into biochars. Um, so adsorption both in and out would dictate that. Um, potentially we have the ability to use biochar as a way to reduce leaching of pesticides, though it may increase persistence, could be a good thing because we might be able to use fewer pesticides. Um, so there are a few implications there. And then other stuff that we tend to look at in our lab is the surface chemistry of the biochars, really how many like oxygen groups are present. Why? Because they're super reactive. Um, certain groups in particular, like the hydroxyl, the carboxylic acid groups actually enhance adsorption of organics. So may help us sequester um, different organics in our biochars. And other groups actually increase heavy metal adsorption as well as some nutrient adsorption and holding capacity. So we also look at thermal stability. Why? Because it's, it may well be a good gauge of how stable our biochars are going to be long-term in the soil. Um, and then just, so I know I'm running short on time. Um, so a few tips for you on accessing lab facilities. Um, certified lab tests can get really expensive if you're in the trial phase. Um, startup company approximate analysis, like what I described, is at least $35 per sample. Um, an ultimate analysis is anywhere from $40 to $150 a sample. Um, so I definitely recommend to people um, to consider partnering with an academic researcher. Um, either if you're willing to let them publish the results in exchange for information about how the samples were made, um, being a co-author with them is great. Um, of course, the benefit of working with um, academics like us is we tend to have good equipment and we can do things um, for little to no or co low cost depending on the research potential. Of course, the drawback to working with us is that we can be a bit slow paced um, and you need to keep us sometimes on target with projects. We require a lot of paperwork. Um, so kind of give you a, a, like a short picture of what it is otherwise that we work on here at Cornell. Um, in collaboration with Jeff Tester down in chemical engineering, our group looks at um, both in situ and up, uh, downstream upgrading of bio oils from pyrolysis and hydrothermal carbonization. We look at upgrading of biochars to a bunch of different high value materials. Um, we are doing that also with Johannes Lehmann. Um, with Jeff and Feng Chi Hu, we work on things like LCA and TCA uh, for how, do, how could we potentially cite uh, conversion processes for these um, pyrolysis units and then get product out to people who want to use it for, say, a soil amendment. And then we also look at um, do some survey work with our colleagues in uh, government to um, determine how we can influence public support for bioenergy or soil amendments made from biomasses. Uh, and then our, our lab capabilities. So what do we do in our lab? Well, we, we do do some um, industrial work with some partners that we have. And this is kind of an example of pretty pictures of a report that we provide people um, along with a little interpretation of, of what kind of what you get when you wanna look at a, a biochar characterization. So from particle sizing to nutrient and metal composition to bio oil analysis. And so kind of a summary, um, we are starting to standardize some characteristics of biochars, but it's a process. Um, and these characteristics, it's important to do this because they do influence biochars use as a soil amendment and other uses as well. There are some simple things that you could do, such as pH, uh, determining density. And there are others that require pretty extensive equipment and knowledge that ICPMS instrument costs a minimum of $100,000. So I don't think most people are gonna put that in their garage lab. And characteristics will vary with feedstock and pyrolysis conditions. And I think some of the other speakers tonight will go into a little bit more in depth in that. So with that, happy to take some questions.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Jillian. That was a very informative talk. Um, wonderful. If you open up the Q&A feature on, the, uh, on Zoom, you'll see that some questions have come in. Um, and I encourage um, participants, as Jillian is answering some of these questions live, to please continue entering questions within the Q&A function. So Jillian, if you just want to work through, I guess, um, the questions, whatever you feel sure. like you want to answer, that would be great. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. I'm like looking at some coming in and I can't keep it all track. So I will try to um, look through and answer them as much as I can. Um, so to answer the, the first question, um, kind of what are, why are biochars, I'm assuming, having recalcitrant properties? I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the question there um, is asking. I'm not quite sure. So Pravin, if you wanna like explain a little bit, I'll go to the next one and then go back. Um, the question asking if you wanna bring a biochar uh, to get tested or certified, how much does this cost? There are actually, um, the last count, I think uh, Kathleen Draper told me that there were only two labs in the country that were even doing um, biochar characterizations, and they were running at about a thousand dollars a biochar. Last I checked, to do everything, to do every test. Um, at Cornell, we're actually working um, with uh, Cornell to be a certified lab to be able to do that. We don't know what our full cost will be yet because it obviously depends on um, it depends on the university structure and what they decide we're allowed to do. Um, I, I can pretty much, you know, guarantee though, it's not cheap. Um, you know, every time we fire up that instrument, the ICPMS instrument, it costs us about a hundred dollars to turn it on. Um, so these things are not, um, not an easy thing to do. Um, so we have a question about how the behavior of PAHs depends on the temperature of the biochar. So this is a great question and it actually has two answers. In terms of the pyrolysis temperature of the biochar, um, depending on whether it was done with slow pyrolysis or fast pyrolysis, if it was done with slow pyrolysis, there's a higher chance of having more PAHs present if we were in about the 550 to 700 degree C uh, range for pyrolysis, um, because that's the, the range where these things are volatilizing and then recondensing on the solid surface. Um, and then in terms of temperature in the environment, uh, higher temperature in the environment. So as the warmer our soil gets as a soil amendment, they do tend to be able to leach a little bit more. And then I think that ties nicely into the next question. Um, are pHs bioavailable or are they stable? Um, and the answer is the field does not know. I have actually seen now um, multiple kind of competing papers and the answer is, is bioavailable depending on what I think. What we've seen so far is that simple, um, kind of simple studies where a biochar is exposed to just flowing water over it, the pHs stay in the biochar, right? They have a preference for the biochar because it's a carbon, it's not water. Um, but if you start putting some organic solvents in there or you start putting some soil with it, we found that some of the pHs can actually move into um, the soil phase. Um, so so we're, we don't have, I don't think, um, a real consensus right now as a field um, basically on that. And I think, um, I don't know, you guys, Mina, you'll stop me, right? <laughs> so, um, oh, this is a great question. We'll stop you, uh, but you can keep answering them if you feel comfortable with that and just sure. maybe a couple more and then we'll, we'll move on and we can keep sure. answering. And I can questions. answer them this way too. Um, yeah. So I think this is a really great question. How is a homeowner going to know if they're going to do more harm than good putting biochar into their raised vegetable beds? Um, okay, so, so most biochar, especially if it's made from a hardwood in a kiln, if you're putting it in in five to 10 weight percent, um, you, could, you, you could eat that amount in your diet 5% per day and be fine. Um, and you can imagine if you're doing that, then, then you're probably not gonna ever see that in your, in your plants that you're growing in your raised bed, okay? What we're really talking about is um, if we start using very large quantities, if we start using it at you know, 50, 60%, like we're talking about potential hydroponic systems incorporating biochar, um, and it also, I think, depends on the, the way that it's made. 
Um, I haven't tested a, an industrial biochar yet that I would be concerned about adding to my garden. Um, though some of them seem to hold water better than others, I will say. Um, so, Jillian, I had a question for you, if that's yeah. right. <laughs> so a question that was asked a few times in Tuesday's webinar was if um, biochar actually um, has pesticide property still. So if there was a feedstock that was exposed to a lot of pesticides, what happens then after it goes through the pyrolysis and is yeah. those remain? I don't remember who did put that study out there, but someone had just put a study out there on like are pesticides recalcitrant or not. I can go look for that. And if I find that, I will send that to the, the list because that is an important question. And I don't, I didn't do the work, so I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, we do know, so we do know that some compounds will stay. So if you added, for example, um, you know, an additional manganese, so an inorganic compound, we know that that tends to stay in the biomass during pyrolysis, so it actually concentrates. I don't know about the organic transitions, though. Yeah, I know that that's a pretty broad question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a couple of people asked it, and I was super curious, so I thought I'd just um, get your- I just saw a paper on that, and I will go try to find it again. Yeah, if you can find it, please send it to me and Debbie, and we'll share it with everyone as well. Definitely. All right, thank you. Well, let's see. Um, so I think we have like three more questions or so. Um, so let's see. Um, so biochar this is a good one and kind of hits at my, my heartstrings. Biochar is commercially available widely, but we don't see the same thing for hydrochar. Um, what are the major bottlenecks in commercialization of hydrochar? And I'm so glad that someone asked this question um, because it's a project we've been working on that we have funding from the USDA to, to look at. And I, I think my hypothesis that is going to be proven soon, um, <laughs> as all good academics would say, um, is that hydrothermal carbonization, it is wet pyrolysis in a sense. Yes, the same molecules that pyrolyze in a dry situation do go into the water phase during hydrothermal carbonization. The problem is that during pyrolysis, they escape in the gas phase and they become a gas or an oil. When they're in the water phase, as the hydrothermal process cools down, a lot of those organics actually end up condensing on the solid phase. And we've played around quite a bit with this. Those organics almost make an amorphous tar that if you rub hydrochar enough on your hands, um, they will get on your hands. So we have concerns in our group, if we use those as, um, if we used hydrochars as soil amendments without removing those um, deposited compounds, that those could be phytotoxic. Um, we know that the compounds are phytotoxic. They're, they're phenols, furans. Um, so, so I think that's the reason why we don't see hydrothermal carbonization and hydrochars for soil amendments. And in terms of their use as activated carbons, they don't have very high surface area um, because they're not heated to the same temperature as um, a biochar is. So that's why we're not seeing that yet, I think. Um, so kind of another question is uh, sewage, can I inform you about sewage sludge biochar? Um, I will say the extent about that, and, and we have worked a little bit with um, dewatered sludge turning it into biochar, is that um, they tend to be higher in heavy metals because the sludge itself is um, kind of getting to be higher in heavy metals these days, and not metals that you necessarily want used as a soil amendment. Um, we're seeing like some lead, uh, silver, zinc. Um, so, so the biochar that comes from that is can be higher in um, higher in heavy metals. It's also not as mechanically stable. It breaks apart really quickly. Um, so, at least in terms of a soil amendment, it will compact really quickly. Um, so, let's see. How about we answer the one last one there? Like yeah, that? if you want to go for one more, okay. and then we'll we'll stop after that, and then there is the option to also type an answer in, Perfect. so it could be that. answered later on as well. Yeah, that sounds good. So, okay. um, I think let's answer the last one because I think it's kind of a cool one. Um, apparently, biochar size varies significantly. Yes, it does. Um, what's the real benefit with smaller size? Um, because you know, some people have been advocating biochar as things like nano fertilizers. So my opinion, um, I, 
I'm concerned about powder and smaller biochars as soil amendments because of the application and the potential risk to um, people who are doing it. If you breathe in um, these activated carbons, if they're nano-sized, uh, that would kind of act like a particulate matter in your lung and it could embed in your lung. So I think as long as you're staying with a commercial, what's right now a commercial biochar, there's minimal risk of that. It doesn't aerosolize. Um, but my concern with using this idea of these nano fertilizers is just how do you apply it safely? Um, in terms of other size, I feel like I'm not a landscape architect or, a, well, not even a very good home gardener. I do well with pots, uh, so I'm not going to comment really on if there's an optimal size, but I will say obviously that um, smaller size particles within reason, like less than a millimeter when we start with, tend to make really high surface area biochars and have really good adsorptive properties. So with that, I'll try to answer some in the, the chat and yeah, I think Bernard is next. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jillian. Um, I will just follow up with your final statement that I did say um, in last during my presentation in the session on Tuesday that um, we do recommend having some basic personal protective equipment when you are applying biochars. If you um, are doing that, minimize doing applications on a windy day because it is very light and dusty. And also recommend if you can find one these days, uh, a particle mask or some type of face covering, um, as well as gloves and just glasses, because that will minimize any risk of inhalation um, if you are applying a finer um, particle sized biochar. So thank you, Jillian. Feel free to continue answering questions. Um, but we will move on to our next speaker this evening, um, Bernardo Del Campo, who is the president and co-founder of Artie Char, um, which is a company based in Iowa. So Bernie, would you like to share your screen and turn on your video? All right, thank you very much, Davey. I'm doing that, give me one second. And thank you for speaking this evening. It's great to have you. Fantastic, well, thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, I'm gonna start a little bit with a comment that um, Gillian was just saying a little bit ago. Um, we make very fine particles of biochar and always we need to be careful, right? Uh, but I, I think there are very easy ways to mitigate those and how we do it is we add water, okay? So the, for example, in the soil you have uh, sun, silt and clay and the clay, if I'm not mistaken, is less than two microns, but you have nano-sized particles in the soil. But you add a little bit of water and then the problem is, um, I would say uh, it's solved pretty much. So. Uh, one point for you know for the audience here is like don't be super scared about this. Did I put the camera? Yes. Let me check. Oh shoot. Bernie, you don't have the video your video on yet. Oh, I see. Give me. Want to go ahead and try and switch that on? Yeah, that's what I was trying. Sorry for that. That's my video. Okay. No, it's not. If you take your uh, cursor and you just scroll it at the bottom of the screen. He's, he's asking me for the host to give me permission. All right, I'll go ahead and I will, I have to ask to start your video, so I'll go do that. I just- There you it. are. No, okay. Yeah. Perfect, <laughs> great. Can Excellent. see you and see your screen, wonderful. Super, so uh, sorry for that, uh, but my point is there's very small particles, right? Flower, it's extremely fine particles. Uh, there's a lot of things that are small particles. Careful, carbon um, reacts differently with the body. But my point is, once it's in water or once it's in soil, it aggregates or start clustering and for money, uh, forming organoclay particles. So those things, I wouldn't be that concerned, but yes, we need to be careful, okay? Uh, fantastic. So let me, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about our company and what we're doing with biochar. We have pretty different concept to what biochar is out there or how we approach it. And well, those are some thoughts that I'm gonna share with you. All right, some of the things that I'm gonna be talking and uh, you will see, we're gonna go back and forth and back again, okay? But basically uh, we're gonna be talking about a, a little bit about Artie and how we started with, some, uh, with a project in Nicaragua. We're gonna talk a little bit about ISU. We come from ISU, we are grad students from ISU. We're gonna be talking about what is our biochar concept, okay? The challenges, opportunities, 
uh, some things that we know that we don't know, some facts and, and some other things in the biochar area. And again, there are lots of things. Biochar is, is so big that this is our understanding of the biochar. Biochar products, we're gonna be talking about uh, what, you know, like uh, the previous Gillian, the previous presenter, what she was showing about the biochar products that are in the market and what we're trying to do. Uh, we're gonna be talking about our biochar approach, okay? Why we think this is the path for, for us and for the industry to go. Um, well, what are the industry needs? Already a little bit about the team and, and the people that work. We got phenomenal people working on, from the people in the shop to the people behind the computers trying to you know, work on the models and, and equipment and such. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about our equipment um, so you have an idea. Excellent. So a little bit about Nicaragua. This was when, when Artie started eight years ago. So we get a grant to go to Nicaragua, uh, make some biochar, put it in the soil and measure greenhouse gas emissions in those soils for a limited time. But the idea was to show, um, you know, like a snapshot of greenhouse gas emissions. So we did this very simple kiln and it's just a 55 gallon drum with some insulation. We put a burner, we, you know, start the fire. Um, and then we indirectly heat the burner, the kiln, until the gases produced will start um, heating itself, okay? So it was like semi-continuous, I would say. We'll load it from one side, we'll rotate it, then we'll unload it from the other side. This would be, uh, wouldn't be the greatest design, but it worked, you know? It was our first approach to uh, put some reactors together. And I think that what we learned with the with this experience in Nicaragua is what, I've, what we have been learning with the biochar industry as a whole. And I'm gonna show some analogies that I think are pretty um, important from, from the biochar perspective. And this is our biochar pile. You know, we had to produce, I think it was like 50 kilograms. All this is 50 kilograms. It's not much, it's like a hundred pounds. I mean, this was eight years ago. So don't quote me on the numbers, but get the concept. The concept is this is not so much. And this reactor worked it has lots of limitations, but worked, okay? So we did enough material for us to run um, our experiments. And this is just some examples. We went, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty interesting that we got a little grant from Europe and then our uh, department, Dr. Robert Brown helped us out a little bit. And then the USDA helped us out uh, quite a bit with some equipment and some things. We went to Nicaragua. And then we set an experiment for three months measuring CO2 emissions, methane and nitrous oxide. And the idea was not to prove anything, but rather to show a concept. So what did we try to show is CO2 is being emitted by the soil. CO2, when you add biochar, emits a little bit more, but the amount of carbon that you sequester in those applications are huge. So yes, you, you produce a little bit more, but it's not so much. And what I'm showing you here is exactly that. These are, diff these are different uh, settings, different fields that we measure CO2 and the other gases. Uh, this was a pasture, beans, an orchard. And the idea was to show that, you know, from the different treatments, we did a bunch of things. Uh, you measure CO2 fluxes, you know, significant fluxes. And then you can calculate CO2 emissions, okay? And careful, this is a very crude snapshot because we're only measuring outputs right outputs from the soil but i mean it's a good it's, it's a good approach okay so um what are the summary from all that okay we measure pasture orchard and beans and then we have different different treatments we have the control the biochar addition the manure the bi biochar manure and this was over a period of three months we were uh, taking measurements every week or two weeks I can't remember somewhere on there and then we start seeing you know how much were those fluxes in three months? And what we did is, if those fluxes are in three months, we're gonna prorate it, you know, for a year or for whatever continuation, which is an exaggeration of the, of the effects. But we saw kind of what we wanted to see. The control, and this is the average of the treatments, were pretty much this much, 23 tons per, per hectare per year of CO2 emissions, 25 on the biochar. The manure was 32, biochar manure was 29. And then the different settings, okay? And this is just a general average. But what did we see, you know? It was this, a little bit more emissions of CO2, yes, and a huge um, sequestration because of the amount of carbon that we're putting in the soil with the biochar in those plots, okay? And this for me was, um, you know, was a kind of a, 
amazing, right? Being able to, yes, this is the literature and this is what we went with very limited uh, amount of money, put all this together, make it happen and get some data. And by the way, I haven't published all this. So I might need a couple of months of vacations to do that. But um, we have plenty of data. I mean, lots of data. So these are the three settings. This was, um, uh, so this is the orchard. This is just a pasture from a small farmer. Um, this is just a beans field um, that the, the farmer had. And we installed these systems and we put here, we measure CO2. Uh, CO2, methane, and nitro nitrous oxide, okay? So anyway, we got uh, very good results. But for us, this is very similar um, to the biochar industry, like I was telling you. Uh, and in those uh, kind of uh, what we found from all this is, can you make a reactor in Nicaragua and make it, you know, make it work? Yes, you can. Can you make biochar? Yes, you can. Can you measure greenhouse gas emissions? Wow, that was tricky. I mean, taking all these uh, uh, lab vials and making all the measurements, it worked out pretty good. These are the, the measurements, I would, but it was quite a bit of a challenge. And the other thing that for me was like super interesting is, is this project feasible? Can we understand whether the feasibility of this, uh, of this kind of systems of making biochar and such, and, and even measuring CO2? Yes, it's feasible. And then I put many more ticks because actually it was such a, a, you know, a surprise to make this work in Nicaragua was very complicated, okay? Making the reactor and spending two days to find a pipe um, going and, and the emissions, we had to almost bribe the guys from customs in order to pass our vials because this was research and they wanted to charge us several thousand bucks. I mean, it was it was quite a bit of a challenge. And then bringing all the samples back in a, in a timely manner, trying to measure with the GCs was pretty amazing. So it was, it's feasible, yes, but oh my gosh, that was a lot of, uh, of challenges involved. And other things, you know, cost of the materials, you know, can you do it? Yeah, um, the biochar will, you know, all the materials that we use are pretty expensive. Operational cost, it's not so simple. You have operational cost and you need to understand that. And this too is, I mean, it's cheap. We make, for example, we use two tanks of propane. Yes, but we produce a hundred kilo, no, 150 kilograms of biochar. So it is, but at the same time, if you put it in perspective, we're talking about in one acre to put a ton or 10 tons of biochar. I mean, those things adds up pretty quickly, okay? Or, or when we talk about carbon sequestration potentials and you say, yep, we're gonna sequester hundred tons of CO2 in an hectare, that's a lot of biochar and those things are not cheap to make. Are they labor intensive? Yes, they are. Mainly because the reactors are very primitive and then you have, uh, you have to be there and rotating and adding material and controlling. And the other thing that we had problems is the smoke, you know? So we have problems smoke, turning it on, get temperature, rotating, moist material. So this needing supervision, that was a challenge, okay? So we learned a lot. And I think this applies exactly to the biochar industry. Just the same, just the same. Uh, let me show you a little bit. We come from Iowa State, we're grad students, um, you know, mechanical engineer, electrical engineers, Oof, we got many people working on this. The core of our uh, mechanical engineers. Um, and well, we work with reactors that they're beautiful. I mean, beautiful uh, research react. Uh, this one here is a gasifier. We have a pyrosis reactor on the left. You cannot wait for research. And they're, in this case, is millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they produce grand size uh, samples. So from seeing all this, you know, beautiful uh, benefits of biochar uh, in many aspects. We said, well, let's start making bigger reactors and, you know, and, and try to do it, but it's not so simple. That's the take home message. It's not so simple. Iowa State, beautiful, uh, beautiful research, beautiful. I mean, as a whole, the, the laboratories and everything is, is amazing. And our colleagues, major professors, um, I mean, very, very, um, very, very intelligent people, everyone, um, you know, so doing research there, it was amazing. Starting our, our company, like a spin-off of Iowa State, huge advances for us, mainly to understand this very complex material, right? So some of the biochar industry analogies. Biochar can be done, it's not so simple, okay? So when people have 55 gallon drums and things, you will see it's not so simple to make. And it's not so simple to make the let's call it good quality biochar, which again, we might debate what is good quality, but 
are consistent by HR, inexpensive, green, uh, all those things, you know, easy, reliable, inexpensive, let me you know, emphasize inexpensive again. So it's not so simple. Um, feedstock, you can use absolutely many feedstock. We have paralyzed all sorts of things in our, uh, in our reactor. Again, start with the easy because even the easy are not so simple, okay? Working with combustors are not simple and moisture is a huge issue. It changes lots of reactions inside of the reactor. It's more tricky. Systems and reactors are complicated, very much so. And you change anything and you change the reactor, you change the reactions that's happening and you change your biochar product, okay? So temperature, number one factor, we know that, but there's a lot more than that, okay? Let me give you an example, just a basic example. Uh, we grab and we paralyze corn stover, phenomenal. We grab that same corn stover and we use some machines and we put some dirt into that stover and then it goes through the reactor, changes quite a bit the, the biochar composition, okay? And uh, yeah, not just quantitative, but qualitative. Capital expenses, the same. Re biochar reactors are not so cheap because if you put in perspective of how, uh, how much you make, operational costs, the same. Um, we need to move away from traditional system because traditional systems, it's very hard to have a, a, an output that is controlled, that you know the quality, um, consistency, that you don't make emissions, smokes, you know, BOC, smokes, and some others, you know, but there it's more difficult to do, all right? So we need to move away from that. It's okay in some places, but slowly the industry needs to be moving to more uh, advanced automated systems, okay? And work on clean, reliable, inexpensive, and versatile systems. Absolutely, okay? Um, oops. And another thing for my colleagues is don't call biochar charcoal because we give a wrong impression to the audience, to the clients. They think charcoal is biochar, you know, the, and then they start using any charcoal for biochar. For biochar, which is a carbon meant for soil, okay? And when we approach and we say it's a carbon for soils, um, what I like to say is biochar always should enhance the growth, improve the soil health, but enhance the growth of the plants. Otherwise, if it's not that the case, we have done something wrong, okay? That's my take home message. And here, these are very old pictures of pyrolysis that I took online a um, long time ago. But my point is the same, they're complicated. And not just complicated, the throughput is not what we would like to see. We would like to see 10 tons per hour of biochar production. And those machines, again, the, the chemical reaction is very slow. So imagine how much material you need to be cooking at the same time in order to get those kind of throughputs with all the challenges of high temperature, you know, gases and all the things that needs to happen. So in the biochar world, um, the reactors for me is one of our constraints. And that's why as, uh, with Ardi, we jump into the game. I say, let's start developing what, what we think should be the reactor for the biochar industry. Industry, mobile units, the same. The, the concept is great, right? All of them, you know? But again, it's it's more difficult. And when you move it like this, it's, uh, oh, there's a lot more challenges. But we do a mobile or portable unit. And I will show you in just a minute. But the point, what is the major point of this is they're very expensive for the amount of throughput that they get. The, the concept is that we don't move the biomass that much, which is extremely expensive. Now you move the reactors where the biomass is. That concept we share, and I think that's correct. But there are lots of challenges, and that's why we need our system. Then we start talking about thermochemical methods. You know, When you guys were saying biochar uh, is not created equal, right? I mean, just a, a catchy phrase on the biochar world, which is exactly that. We call biochar pretty much anything, any carbonaceous material, well known. Uh, so there are lots of things that fall into the biochar world, okay? If we use the IBI and the H2C ratio and the carbon content and all those things, great. Uh, we screen a little bit, but still in all the materials that it will follow in the category of biochar, there are many, many uh, biochars and many, many char characteristics. So we need to know, okay? So the biochar producers and the clients, they need to know what is biochar, how you use it and how it's made. And then we like to sell a general biochar for general use. But if we know about the situation, about the plants, about the soil, how the, the client is gonna use it, then we can engineer it a lot more. So this is just an example of different thermochemical com uh, conversions. And I didn't put hydrothermal liquefaction, which we were talking a little bit ago. 
but these are general processes that you can get some chars, okay? Some chars and some biochars, okay? Torrefaction, carbonization, slow pyrolysis, fast pyrolysis. We are here in the middle. We are intermediate, intermediate pyrolysis, but these are the general category for, for these kind of technologies. And then the one at the bottom that I cannot see because I have that, and gasification, right? And all of them, you produce a kind of char, but they're very different chars very, very different charts and their applications. I wouldn't call good or bad, but the properties are very different and the applications should be considered very different, okay? I'm not gonna go into too technical because I can put you to sleep very quickly, but keep in mind, you can make very, uh, you know, carbon wall is enormous. So you can make all sorts of different carbons and they all look black, but chemically and physically are very different and their applications too. So we talk a, lot, a little bit about the biochar world. Let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about RD biochar approach. From what we know, from what we learned from Iowa State, Iowa State you know, we, I did my PhD in biochar. My colleagues did you know, PhDs and masters in thermochemical conversions. Well, let's gear up to the biochar world that we wanna see. And we're gonna show you some biochar products or what we think the biochar product should be. RD reactors and equipment, I'm gonna, very uh, shortly mention or, or see some of the equipment that we make, but we make a lot of equipment, more than you know, 50 different types of equipment, uh, not just reactors, but everything around it. Uh, and our consultation, R&D, engineering, energy efficiency, economics, all those things we do. We feel the need that every time you want to sell a product like a biochar reactor, which biochar products are very complicated, biochar reactor is even more complicated, you need to help the client and assist them throughout, throughout all the process, from the development of the project, project to the implementation, turnkey, and even running, and helping make the, the product um, that they want to do, which is not so simple. This is one of the, of the products that we have. Go to our website. We have a promotion that, so you can help us out, okay? This is 50 bucks with free shipping. All right. Um, Biochar products, how we make biochar. I'm gonna show you, you know, some concept that I wanted to share uh, to the general audience, right? We can go very technical, but I want you to you know, understand what are, what are the things that I see more important on the biochar making. Then we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about biochar is a carbon-based material, right? And with that being said, it's not a fertilizer, it's a soil amendment. And how we need to treat the biochar concept um, and how we need to sell our products, okay? I'm gonna briefly talk about technical parameters, okay? And then engineering biochar production, okay? The engineering biochar production, I think is where, where um, you know, the, the fun stuff is, is how you make the right biochar for that application or the best biochar for that application and that situation. So these are some uh, snapshots of our system, enters the biomass into our system. It cooks their ogres at very high temperature. The gas comes out of those, um, of those pipes, then we add some some air, and then it burns. That pyrolysis gas from the biomass uh, heats up the pipe, and you control the temperatures of of the system. And this is what you make, you know, a charcoal, right? No biochar we make, right? So biochar, you make a charcoal for soils, all right? So um, the idea is there's a lot of science and understanding of how to make this work and how to optimize this. Okay, that is uh, very important. And now I'm gonna show you what is our approach to biochar reactors. This is our, uh, you know, uh, our cook, uh, cookie cutter biochar system. So we have a, a truck, in this case it's walking floors, so we don't need anything. Uh, we don't need a silo, for example. The material comes, we integrate our automation to the hydraulics and everything comes down to this bin and then it goes through the system. And I'm gonna show you in a minute more. Uh, I'm gonna dissect our system and show you more. But basically is material comes, grinds, dry, carbonize, cool down, and then we bag it, okay? This is this container does it all in one pass, continuous pass, it's very simple. Well, very simple, the concept. All right, um, biochar is a carbon-based material. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this. You know, biochar, our biochar we make depends again on the feedstock. We have been paralyzing byproducts of the industry. We have paralyzed bones. We have paralyzed chicken litter or, or manures. 
they're all different. We, we are paralyzed by a solace, by the way. Wow, what a product by a solace. Um, all sorts of things we have paralyzed. So it's a carbon-based product. And on top of that, you do a lot of things, okay? And in some cases, for, for example, for filtration, you can activate it even furthermore. I wanna talk a little about that. All right, the benefits of biochar. Poof. We have plenty of benefits. We all know the benefits, but careful, you know? This is something that I like to, I wouldn't say caution, but don't be, for the biochar people, it's like, you know, when we go out and we talk and we, you know, show that all these things are down, it sounds unrealistic, you know? So all these things are done, but it doesn't mean that all the biochars do all this in all those situations. There's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of things that needs to happen. So things that I like to always emphasize, carbon sequestration. This material, it's incredible for carbon sequestration. And that's the number one thing that we need to push. Carbon sequestration, greenhouse gas reductions, the, the same erosion, well, it depends, but in most situations, we will aggregate better the soils, depends, but we'll create better structures in soils. And that would you know, lead to better uh, infiltration, better aeration, better you know, uh, root uh, exploration, all sorts of things. Uh, leachate reductions, the same, depends how you make it. But, you know, in general, if we do a good biochar for those situations, we will. The other thing is increase organic matter. I think that is a concept that we need to go out and, and make sure that the agronomists know. I talk to so many agronomists and they don't know, first of all, what is biochar and how easy it is for us to turn organic matter, which is the soul of the soil, is the organic matter, okay? Any agronomist go to a soil and see this black, you know, you know dark black soil and you know I say well this is a proactive soil you know you can you know so my point is that those are the things that we really need to emphasize the pH careful with the pH because the pH can go both ways we can make somewhat acid biochars and we can make very basic biochars and we need to understand those because the soils are very different and they will respond very different to those basic concept when we're talking about CEC, cation exchange, and ion exchange capacity, we're talking before about salinity and the electroconductivity. Those things we need to completely understand before we say, use, use this biochar. This is the best solution for your soil. So those are things that, again, you know, we need to make sure that we understand the basic concepts. Yes, thereby the general biochar will work generally well in all those soils, in most of the soils, yes. But if we know more about the soil, we can really start, um, you know, taking it to the next level of, of production, of you know, reduction of leachate, aggregation, all those things, soil compaction, increasing fertilizer efficiency, you know, the cation exchange capacity. Those are things that are incredible how much we can change the soil. You know, you change organic matter and the CC in the soil and you, you completely change that soil. Increase productivity and, and yields, yes. But again, we need to know what we're doing, okay? This is just a, a, a cool example of a, a, our material that we put in Iowa State. Uh, no biochar and biochar, you know, these are the, the trials. This is some trials in golf courses. This is the root development of many plants. I grow plants in 100% of biochar. You know, my colleagues will say, well, add up to 20% of biochar because, you know, whatever. We'll say, depends. In most of the biochars, that's what you need to do. In some others, you can grow 100% with no uh, soil, just biochar on the plants. But it's not so simple, okay? That's the point. So you need to know. There's a lot that every one of us needs to know more about the biochar in order to, you know, promote this and move these things forward, okay? Benefits of biochar, lots of benefits, okay? Air, water, and soil, okay? But again, Depends how you make it, depends the applications, depends what are the benefits in the different the different areas, you know. We want to sequester a lot of carbon with that biochar. Well, maybe, those are my kids, maybe that's not the better biochar for that improvement in the soil that you want to do, right? So those are the things we need to understand or, or the same with the carbon sequestration. Are those the better biochars for water retention? Probably not. But if we know what we need, what we want to accomplish, and that's why you know we talk to our clients and well, what kind of biochar you want, and then we, you know, we start from there. Then we start modifying a lot of things in the processing to get the better biochar we can with the feedstock that they have, right? And the feedstock that they have, there's an economic equa equation: is this feedstock or the one 50 miles away 
or the other one 100 miles away. Those things need to be understood, okay? Well, the greenhouse gas reduction, everything. Fantastic. I'm doing pretty good. All right, increasing yields. So these are some of the of the uh, comments and, and, and things that we put in our labels, you know. Um, again, those, all those things are true in those specific situations are true, okay? Some of the things that I would like to, uh, all the <laughs> biochar enthusiasts um, to, uh, I would say, think, think further is biochar, uh, directly changes a lot of things and indirect, indirectly changes a lot more things, okay? When we say, for example, the biochar retains and reduces leachate and nutrients, great. Yes, there is some chemical absorption or physical absorption of, of some nutrients, great. But the biology could be a hundred times more. The microbial community that you change, the increase in organic you know, in organic uh, biota of those soils, or even the increase in plant growth, if you get to those points, can do a lot more than the biochar itself, right? Um, the cation exchange capacity is same, the biochar is great, but guess what? You improve the yields of your soils, and in two years, that the same plants are putting 10% more of uh, organic matter to the soil, and guess what the organic matter does to your, your CC in soils? Right. So those are the things that indirectly we need to understand a lot more. So yes, the direct effect may be easier to measure. The indirect effect is even more complicated and could be, uh, in terms of scale, a lot more. Right. The carbon sequestration potential that we can do for for improving the biology in the soil, the organic matter deposition, the increase in plant growth could be a lot more than the one to ten tons of biochar that we're putting. Right. And the same, the opposite, if we do the things wrong, okay? But again, these are just some concepts. Holding water, phenomenal. Can we hold water? Yes, there's some biochar that hold three times the weight in water, 10 times maybe some, some uh, the weight in water. But guess what? You structure the soil well and your biochar makes better aggregates. And the same soil will increase a lot more the water retention, more than 10 tons per hectare or 30 tons per hectare because the structure of the soil is so much better now. So with that being said, um, these are the biochar products that we make and we make liquid products and we make solid products. This one, it's liquid, but it's solid. So there are solid suspensions of very small particles in water, okay? And in this water, what we do is we add some nutrients, we add some microbes. We also have biochar in water for my biochar enthusiastic people. But um, what we always recommend, you know, is not just selling the carbon. The plants don't eat carbon. The plants eat the, the macronutrients, micronutrients, and, and well, all the synergy with the microbial community, which is huge. And we need to understand a lot more. We barely understand the biochar, the synergies in the soil and the plant we have no clue. So those are the things that we need to, I would say, put a lot more effort in the research. Again, my personal opinion. But um, we, th we see that the biochar suspension, what are we trying to do with this? Increase a lot more the efficiency. Instead of putting, I would say, one to 10 tons of biochar per hectare, like we were talking before, well, put, you know, 500 kilograms and have 20 times the effect that actually putting um, a, a lot more amount in these solid forms. So if you ask me, this is what we need to push for, okay? And these are, again, they're very fine particles in suspension in water. So is there a safety, a safety risk? I wouldn't, no, I would say no, but I mean, it's in water, right? So we go, we apply it. This is meant for irrigations. We put in irrigations line in sprayers and we spray that. They're very, very fine particles. The solid particles is great. And if I'm, if I'm a client, if I'm you, I would buy something that really brings some nutrients. Um, the concept of being aged the same, I would use more like a compost and biochar or vermicompost, worm casting and biochar, things that the biochar started to age, started to react with the, with the, with the soil and start you know, filling up with nutrients and microbial life. That's what we need. So these are some of the products we make. This is worm casting and biochar, beautiful product. Uh, compost and biochar, you know, these are the things that in the biochar world, you know, we can emphasize, go ahead and buy biochar by itself, 
because it's the greatest thing. But it, honestly, for people that don't know how to use this, I always recommend these other products, compost, biochar with 10% biochar. This is 50% and warm casting and biochar, and this is 10% of, of by volume of, of, of biochar because you cannot go wrong. If I grow biochar, this one, for example, that comes from the reactor and I dump a lot in top of the plant, guess what's gonna happen? There's gonna be a lot of immobilization of nutrients right from the get-go. You can see, uh, severely, I would say, immobilize nutrients, maybe you know, lots of reactions in the soil, in the micro, microbial community and the water absorption. So you unbalance everything. And then the plant can suffer, can get yellow. You can kill a plant if you don't do it right, right? Again, those are for you know, very large applications, concentrated, not knowing what we're doing. So in general, I recommend always the organic stuff, you know, that's already with nutrients are ready to use. But if you're biochar enthusiastic, only biochar and water dump, these are the liquid forms that also we, we sell them in pails. Great. And if this one, for example, for, for people that use a lot of nutrients, they're very, they're very high concentration in nutrients. So the carbon acts as a sponge, okay? That is the, the overall message of all those. Uh, let's not put uh, fertilizer by itself and leach away a lot of it, put it in a solution that the carbon holds some of that, right? And yes, in the soil, it's gonna be solubilizing back into the soil solution. But again, um, they're partially you know, absorbing to the carbon. And these are some of the same products with you know, different uh, formulations. You know, the biochar we sell cubic, um, one, uh, one cubic yard bags or two cubic yard bags and, and these small ones or the totes. These are plants in 100% of biochar. I mean, we just put a picture of that. Um, and yeah, and we sell, you know, all sorts of forms. And some, some clients actually send, in, send us um, fertilizers or things to include into the biochar, and then we mix them, all right? So basically that is, you know, my take home message, biochar per se, no, biochar as a, as a base material for bringing all the other benefits to the soil, but biochar, it would be like the soul of that, of that product, all right? All right, some other things, technical Bernie, problems. Sorry yes. to interrupt, but before you move on, just because we, we have gotten a lot of um, questions about this and you've been talking about this a bunch is application rates associated with biochar. Um, what would be, a lot of people ask, what, what is a you know, recommended rate? What is a detrimental rate for biochar application? Do you think you could just comment, comment on that for a second? Oh yes, and um, please interrupt me, Debbie. Um, and we'll, we'll address them. So it, it also, in, in agronomy, I like it because you, you go with a question and you get another question. So it's always depends, right? So for example, we want to improve the soil. What do you want to improve? You want to improve the cation exchange capacity? That would be one dose. You want to, you want to improve, improve the organic matter? That's another dose. You want to improve the, the water retention in soil? That's another dose. You want to improve, I don't know, uh, the salinity in, in salinity soils. Well, we'll use a biochar with very low EC, but the amounts that we'll need are very significant. So it all depends. It all depends tremendously. But what I would recommend for in any situation without knowing anything about it is we need, we need decent amount of biochar. So in any situation, you will, you will put one ton to 10 tons per hectare just to start. I mean, biochar is, let's put it, in a simplistic way, is carbon, carbon for soil. How much carbon there is in an hectare? A hundred tons in some soils. How much are you adding? One to two more. Well, uh, you are improving that. You improve the organic matter of the soil and you improve all the benefits that the organic matter brings. That would be kind of an, an analogy of the biochar use. That's what we're doing, the grinding of the biochar because that would be exponential, the benefits, right? So instead of applying several tons, now you need a couple of hundred kilograms for having the same effect. That's what we're trying to do. But going to your question, it's very hard to know without knowing the, the situations, right? Um, what I like to do is how much organic matter that carbon, that soil has? What is the, the natural or, uh, content of organic matter of those soils? That would be the ideal amount, right? For those type of soils. Careful, in the lab, we have a soil that has 2% of organic carbon, and we can turn it into 20% organic carbon, organic carbon, unheard of, right? Yeah, but those are not realistic situations, but you can do that. And you can turn that into a, an amazing soil, an, an amazing soil. 
So I didn't answer your question, but if you give me some more information about that and what you want to do, what you want to increase, then we can start tweaking more and more. I have clients that they come and say, you know what? I have a sandy soil with eight um, milli equivalent every 100 grams of soil. We want to increase it to 12. Fantastic. We can we can work on that. I want someone someone else to say, well, we got very acidic pH of soils. Can we use this type of biochar? How much we're going to increase? That's a very difficult equation. So yeah, we can tweak on this and we'll need this much for increasing 0.5 units of pH. So those are the things that there's a lot of R&D and knowledge, but there, those are the kind of the directions of the biochar industry that we need. What you need to change, what, what plants, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. What is the environment, what plants, and uh, then we start, you know, getting more and more um, uh, where you want to go. Actually, you, <laughs> that was a presentation that I want to show you. So is what kind of chart do you have? You know, you're asking me how much. There's some charts that are so well, they're so basic that in some soils, you cannot add much because you will increase the pH too much. Well, add that much. I mean, very large amounts, all right? But I've seen pHs of 12 of biochar. So how much you're going to add? Careful because you can turn the soil, uh, start chelating metals and get it to the point that it starts mobilizing lots of micronutrients and your plants are gonna suffer. So careful what you do. Um, environmental conditions, the same. You're putting you know, chicken litter biochar with a huge uh, EC, right? Um, salinity, lots of salt. And you put in a sandy soil that barely rains. And guess what? You have detrimental growth on your plants. So you need to understand, but in other situations it's beautiful. Uh, so what you want to improve, you know, the, the same thing, you know, there's some biochars like this one, the, 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 the we're, we're working with some very heavy in, in nutrients, believe it or not, biochars, which you can make from some feedstock. And the same, you're just going to say, well, we're going to add this much because this is how much soluble uh, nutrients we have and that's how much we need. Well, because we need to change that in the soil. So there is a lot of knowledge that goes below our recommendation. That's why I put four agronomists when we have big projects, and then we start tweaking down. And to make things even more complicated, like in, a, in the biochar world, you change one thing and you change another one. And that's what I'm going to be showing in a little bit. Okay. But look at this soil. This is a, a soil, a, a Germany trial that we're working on. Look at this soil. Look at the biochar that we're using. There were parts that weren't even non parameters, right? So, anyway, um, it's not bad. But what I'm saying is, these were the larger particles. You know, in this reactor, the larger particles weren't or this batch didn't, didn't work very well. Look at those soils, you know, with 500, 1,000 years of agriculture, you can improve them with nothing. Wouldn't be the same as the moly soils that we have here. But um, yeah, so those are things to really think. My, my researcher friends, this is a lot more complicated, you know? So um, yeah, just call me. I'm very inexpensive, a couple hundred bucks an hour. All right, um, and this one, I, I guess you guys know Lehman. Or Johannes Lima, I think he knows a little bit about this. And what is the point with this chart? I bring it over and over from one of you know his beautiful papers. Um, look how much it changes the properties of that carbon with the temperature, right? It's just one feedstock, that temperature, and you change everything, right? And what is a good biochar? High surface area biochar? I might disagree a little bit with my colleague Gillian, but um, no, it's a lot more complicated. Look at the carbon recovery, look at the CC, look at the pH, how it changes, right? So uh, it's a paradigm. So look at this, uh, surface area, you know? Um, I work a little bit in surface area for my PhD and I, I don't like to, I, I don't even use surface area term because I think people in general overestimates what the surface area value gives you. Why is that? Let me give you the, the conclusion of what I, what I came out. Surface area, like we're seeing before, is nitrogen adsorption. The biochars and the micropores, the very, very small micropores, are most of the surface area. And those ones, in general, for more of the agronomic side of things that we, we like to see, are not the more the ones that contribute the most. So it's a little, a little bit misleading, right? For example, in water adsorption, we'll like macropores that this or mesopores like that, for the microbial growth, the same, you know, for cations, yes, we can go through the surface area, but there's a lot more in the functional groups than the surface area. So all those things, my point is, 
I don't even talk about surface area with my clients. I try to walk them away from that because it's a little bit misleading, right? People see this kind of picture. Of, uh, this is a charcoal from, I think I took it from Itaka Institute. And you see all those pores and you say, you, I want really good amounts of surface area. I said, no, you want, if you're looking for the porosity, go ahead and measure skeletal density and measure the porosity, but don't correlate surface area. Even in, in the adsorption world, give me one second, my, my son is distracting me. Mommy. So um, in the adsorption world, we talk about surface area, like the holy grail for performance. And I think it's completely um, a random, not a random, but you know, it's very hard to really correlate adsorption capacity of hydrogen sulfide in a gaseous media with surface area or hydrogen, or for example, um, I don't know, CBOD removals in water with surface area. Do those and then you will find a, a big cloud of, of results. Nothing really uh, explaining, hey, we got more surface area, we got more of this. It's not so simple, right? So people talk about surface area like the holy grail and for me, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Might be wrong, but that's my impression. Um, and this is our example from a database, you know, and you start seeing surface areas, you know, from roughly 200 biochars, 100, this is the 100 level, this is the 500 level, actually it's a little bit higher, but there are a few biochars that have uh, 500, you know? So this one will be the lower end of the activated carbon, right? So if surface area is the best thing for soil, start putting activated carbon in your soils with 500 to 1000 square meter per gram, right? And honestly, you will find that that's not the, the, you know, all the, the, chem, the, um, uh, the chemisorption properties that goes along with the, with the functional groups are not surface area, are not surface area. So my point is, it's a lot more complicated. Don't look into surface area. Okay, take that message. All right, what else? Um, Rooney, um, do you think you could wrap it up in about three or four minutes? We would just wanna make sure we get to, we have time for questions. Um, I, thought I, have, I thought I have 10 more minutes. I'm in the middle of a presentation. Okay, okay, I'll go super fast. No, no, no. Um, uh, Johannes did talk about uh, biochar as a carbon negative um, yep. solution, but keep going. I'll, but I just want to make sure we have time for questions. Okay, I'll go super fast. Um, only the final concept. One ton of biochar uh, with 80% carbon can sequester three tons of CO2, right? That is a message for you to take. Uh, one to three, one pound of, of biochar, three pounds of CO2 more or less, I'm just giving you a round number. This is direct, there's a lot more because in, again, in the indirect measurements, there could be a lot more in both ways, but just for you to have an idea, you know, you can sequester a lot of carbon. And then you go through engineering biochar production. This is what we need to do. Look at this, this is a, a, a client of us that he's uh, growing hemp and he comes very worried and say, look at my shorts, I wanna start growing this. Fantastic, we turn that soil careful we completely transformed that soil with 200 cubic yards of material. Sorry, from that 10% is biochar. From 2.4 organic matter to seven, this seven is six months after you know, we're harvesting, we just measured a little bit ago. But you this is before and this is after, completely transformed the soil. And this soil from, from this organic matter, um, from this organic matter, uh, this is three, five percent is the biochar, and from five to seven is the compost. So it's going to come down, but not not too much. You can build up that soil and still get a beautiful soil after. On the machines, we make machines. That's what we like to do. We come from the board and the concept, and we develop equipment, and we we develop equipment, and we make them. This is a modu modular system that we sell. If you're interested, you contact me. These are dryers that use the same heat. Again, we're talking about sustainability. We use the same heat. There's plenty of heat. There's plenty of heat. Uh, this is, I dissect the system. This is the truck with the trailer bin, goes through the dryer, comes down, comes through the reactor, it carbonizes, goes through the cooling tower and goes through the back. Straightforward. And if you're interested, you come to our place and we'll show you. This is more advanced systems to, for bio condensing systems. Bio, it's a different animal. It's very hard, but you can do it. Uh, I'm gonna move on. So modular systems, we see um, you know, a huge potential in this modular system because you move them. In one day you put it on a truck, in another day it's producing. Oops. We have some equipment around the world. This is some of the machines that we have made. Um, R&D, 
yes, we have been gaining you know lots of knowledges from all the projects that we have do. We are heavy in R and D because every project you need to go through a lot of things. So developing products, you know, understanding the cost of production, LCAs, understanding you know carbon intensities, all those things are very very important for any concept. We do a lot of research. So if you're a researcher and you're interested in biochar materials, let us know. We make uh, this kind of, um, we call it activator because actually you, you paralyze and you can also do steam activation and some other things that we sell and we have one, okay? So we, they send us materials, we paralyze it, we go through the conditions that they want and we send it back. And this is huge because you can make materials in a matter of hours and tweak here and there and get in a continuous fashion lots on lots of different materials. Gosh, energy wise, we have so much energy that we're wasting. It's just ridiculous. We use quite a bit in the dryer, roughly 10%, but all the other is just wasted. Okay, so we, are, um, we have designed system for utilizing that waste uh, heat. In this case, um, it's $110,000 of, of, of avoided heat. This is a, an example of a situation for a greenhouse. The water, what else we learned? That the cheap biomass, it comes, it's big, it has a lot of contamination and it has water. So our equipment has to handle all those things. The water, in some cases, pyrolysis system, the dryers are more expensive, that is the most expensive components. And what we did is make a simple system that actually uses the heat to dry, not a lot, but 15% moisture of the material. And then you can still run it continuously and you save a lot of propane and a lot of heat, all right? Self-sustained system. We turn it in one, one hour, the propane, you turn it off and then self-sustain with the pyrolysis process. Afterburners, emissions, oh my gosh, emissions is huge. So we learned a lot from, from our equipment in terms of emissions and how important these equipment are. We do CFDs, we you know control temperatures, evaluate the velocity of the gases, the composition, a lot of things. Mixing, oh my gosh, more stuff on the mechanical transport of, of material and the mixing, the dryers, oof, another uh, very interesting piece of equipment. We make indirect heat exchangers, uh, sorry, heat exchangers for using the heat in other purposes. These are different CFDs that we understand the efficiencies. Cooling towers, in many cases, most cases we add water. In some other cases, we cannot add water to cool it down once the, the, the batch is done. So we do you know, different equipment for that water filtration, developing big filters, and uh, yes. And now we have questions. Go ahead, Debbie, I'm ready for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie, I apologize if you started no, rushing no, through good. that. I didn't mean, mean to, that there's a lot there and I think we're realizing the industry is rapidly growing and advancing and there's lots of R&D going into it. Um, and I think you were able to share that with us. So. If you go down um, and you see the Q&A at the bottom of the um, Zoom, you'll see there's a number of questions that have come through. Um, maybe you'd be able to just kind of work Q &A? down through a few of them. If not, I'll be able to read them to you. I'm having a little trouble. Wait a second. Uh, can you see my screen? Is it here yes. that I need to go? Chat's um, here? Within the Zoom, there's a chat option and a Q&A option. Say so, yes. So the Q&A? If you click on Q and A, Perfect. there should be a number of open questions. Perfect. There, I have open question. Marco, is a char produced by gasification classifiable as biochar? Depends how you make it. Okay, depends how you make it. In general, the gasification purpose is to get is to get gases. So a good gasification system, again, depends. It will make hydrogen and carbon monoxide in high levels and very little of the carbon is gonna be remaining in the, in, the, in the solid phase. That's the purpose of gasification. We add air to combust the material. So you can tweak that, so you start producing biochar. So yes, you can make biochar, but it's not, um, yeah, it's not what it's, the gasification is, is intended for. That's why we classify our, our equipment as pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is uh, heating up in the absence or where, very little oxygen. So the oxygen doesn't react with the solid phase, okay? What do you mean with traditional system? Traditional system of charcoal making. So those are pits and they're, um, how do you go? Um, uh, those little hoops that, you know, you make the, the charcoal that they cover with dirt and then they pre-ignite and they carbonize the system with incomplete combustion. 
those. Go ahead and type charcoal systems, uh, traditional charcoal systems in Google, and you might find plenty of pictures. Any thought about the, oops, sorry, any thoughts about large scale solar drying for input uh, stream? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, we have plenty of heat. The uh, so, uh, solar drying uh, definitely works and helps a lot, but careful. It, remember the concept that I said before about the capital cost in terms of the output, the same with the solar drying system. It could be very expensive for the amount of moisture that you're removing, but yes, for sure. Sandia, I think I know you. The large container containerized unit that you showed, how many tons of biomass can you process in an hour with that? And does it turn, it doesn't run on electricity, excellent. So uh, the container system that I showed you before, and it's, these slides are gonna be available later, in the ideal world, oh my gosh, this is moving. In the ideal world, it produces, uh, we can process eight tons of dry material, roughly to 10 tons of wet material, we vaporize a ton to two of moisture, and then eight tons dry will go through the system in ideal conditions. Um, so you will produce two tons of biochar in the ideal conditions, or one, right? Between one and two, that's what we, what we see. Um, and what else was your comment? Does it run on electricity? Absolutely, we have many small motors. Our system uses five kilowatt of power. The grinder is actually the one that uses the most but the, the pyrolysis is five kilowatts and in total is less than 10, right? So, sorry, five is the dryer and the reactor and almost five more is the grinder. How do you get liquid biochar to root level? Does it leach from uh, more easily? Excellent point. Uh, no, um, how do we do the liquid char? We grind it extremely fine. We develop a machine that it works beautifully for grinding very small particles. And then uh, that one it stays in suspensions with the water. Again, depends how you do it. Um, does it leach more easily? It, what we do it is so it can percolate through the profile and depends on the soil if it percolates one inch, two inches or six inches. But in general, I would say it will stay within the six inches and then start aggregating in the soil. And imagine all the organics that start uh, adding to the biochar particles. So it doesn't go uh, too far down. Imagine this. Um, the natural fires, not how we do it now, but the old natural fires with a lot of vegetation will make the biochar and it will make the, the biochar or the carbon and it will stay on top. And then slowly this through the you know, uh, biology, earthworms and, and mice and everything, will start going through the, through the soil. You now the cracks when it dries and, 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 and hydrate the soils and the rain would percolate this through the profile. And how much do you have? three, six feet of soil, right? So that's what in the ideal conditions, that's how or in hundreds of years, that's how much you will see it percolate through the soil. Curious about the liquid biochar. That's why it just suspends well in water and how do you apply to soils? Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, depends how you make it. Once you do a, um, a suspension, you're making a colloid and the colloid suspends in soil, in the water. So it does suspend fairly well, depends how you do it. It could be one day of suspension, could be a week of suspension, depends how, what the material, how we make it. Um, how you apply to soil, you just water it. And that's the beauty of this. You put it in watering systems, it could be an irrigation line, uh, a water cannon, or you can, you know, the, the, the sprayers that you use for, um, for liquid fertilizer, you can add that. And we actually do a, um, a hydrocytic mixture with very high concentration of nutrients for special clients and that they applied in hydrocytors, okay? But again, there, the amount of carbon is not much. It's just like a sponge for the nutrients, but it helps. Um, you add carbon, but it's not that much. I'm a homeowner with raised vegetables and herb beds. I make my own compost and buy worm casting, both of which I wanted to use to inoculate the biochar, I would buy. I, was, uh, I use compost now in my beds, but thought about adding biochar, absolutely. And what I always recommend is for the people that buy biochar itself, mix it with the compost and the worm casting two weeks and then use it. And we'll put water because once you put water, the biochar start reacting with the soil in lots of ways. So add water, mix it with the compost and worm casting, best thing you can do. The pH of my soil in the beds is about 7.5, careful, because you see we're getting to the range of uh, high pH of soils. So I would call me and I will make a, a lower pH biochar for that. Is that an inoculated biochar a good idea? And if so, how much? Yes, absolutely, it's a good idea. Careful with the pH, 
because mo most of the biochar that I'm familiar online, they're high in pH, okay? And careful with the pH because it's not something static, but um, we'll give you a good idea. Have you experienced altering uh, functional groups with peroxide or acids? Absolutely. Don't do it, but absolutely. Um, and that's for the researchers, guys. What is the dry feedstock volume uh, throughput of your pyrolysis process? Dry feedstock volume, and the biochar is extremely low dense. So let's say 15 pounds per cubic feet, you can make more, depends on the material. So multiply that for, you know, I would say eight cubic yards a day, maybe a little bit more. Depends what you're doing and what are the temperatures that you do. Excellent. What else? Um, Debbie, any other? Nope, I think that's all the questions we have for you. So you're off the hot seat now. Thank you very much, Bernie. Um, sure. That was a very informative presentation and I'm sure folks can, um, his email address is right there on the on the page um, and you can find him at rd.com um, to learn more um, about some of the R&D currently going on in the biochar industry. So thanks again, Bernie. Um, excellent, excellent. There's, we'll one more, there's one more question. Can I answer it? Um, sure, go ahead and then we'll move on to Chumpy after that. I understand activity carbon is not biochar. We sell a lot of biochar, but we have tons of wood-based activated carbon. Can we use that in soil? Yes, um, again, depends on what activated carbon is. Careful with the, okay, another thing for my colleagues that I forgot to put, don't call, I like to call activated for the physical or chemical process that we make activated carbon. For microbials, I like to call it inoculation, right? So when people say I uh, biologically activated, no, you inoculate it and leave the activated word for the activation process, which is we grab that carbon and then we heat it very high temperatures, let's say 800 degrees Celsius, and then we grab steam at those temperatures and then the steam start breaking the carbon even further more. Or we put some chemicals at 500 degrees or 600 and that chemical start breaking the carbon more. So it's making all sorts of physical pores and also uh, functional groups on the carbon. So for my colleagues, inoculation and activation, let's keep it different. Thank you, Debbie. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bernie. Um, feel free to contact him if you have more questions. And there are other, you know, there are plenty of biochar companies and people making char um, and, and various products. Um, so yeah, there's, a, there's still a lot to learn, a lot of questions to be answered. Um, so now we're gonna move on to our, our last speaker. Thanks again, Bernie. Um, our final speaker tonight is Dr. Chomke Bannock, um, who is a postdoc research associate at Iowa State University. And she's gonna be talking about um, some more advances in research with, um, with manure specifically. Um, so we've had several questions Oh, my, sorry, my video turned off. I apologize for that. Um, she's been working extensively with manure-based biochars and gonna be talking about some advances in her research. And we've had several questions from attendees so far about swine-based biochars and other manure-based products. So I think this is quite relevant for our audience. So thank you, Chumpke, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Debbie, uh, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation for this talk. Uh, so um, my talk will be uh, not on the uh, on the biochar uh, on on animal manure best, but it's more about uh, using the biochar any 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 biochar uh, using that biochar as a as an absorber of nutrient from the animal manure. So Chunky, there is a sorry. Yes, could you, difference. Yes. Could you so, just put your um your PowerPoint and present in the mode so it's full screen presenter right, mode? Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Perfect. And uh, right. hello everyone. And uh, this is Chumki from Iowa State University. And uh, thanks, Bernie. You you made my uh, work uh, easy because you talked about the biochar and a lot lot about biochar. And uh, I thought maybe I shouldn't. Uh, go uh, in the biochar much, but it is more like the application of biochar and uh, 
uh, its nutrient absorbing capacity. So the title is like the valorization of biochar and application in the nutrient recycling from the animal manure. So in the, in the Iowa State University, I work with uh, two uh, different departments. Uh, one is the Bioeconomy Institute and they produce the biochar and the Department of Agricultural and Biosystem Engineering or ABE, where we valorize that biochar uh, for, for uh, better use in the, in, the, in the soil or maybe any remediation kind of work. So uh, Iowa rank one in the pork production and uh, in, the, in the United States. And the industry is quite big. And uh, the output is like over 40 billion. That's a lot of money. And it's by raising 24 millions of pigs at a time. But we are not going to talk about that much money. We will talk about like uh, manure. Like, and each pig actually produces 1.2 gallons of manure per day. So you can imagine or calculate like how many billion gallons of uh, manure these industries produces annually. So that's a lot, that's a lot. And then, uh, but the swine manure, it's a very good nutrient source. It is ve like very cheap, inexpensive, but high in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, like macronutrient and micronutrient. So the swine manure can be applied and uh, to the to the uh, to the field uh, crop field and uh, can replace the inorganic fertilizers to some extent and get a little more uh, dollar, but there are several issues with swine manure uh, that makes this uh, thing uh, less of the use for uh, for the uh, general like people in the garden or. Uh, or, or, or the uh, vegetable beds, uh, because they are uh, odorous. That's the main issue. And then they contain more than 90% of water. So here is a, here is a, a picture of a swine barn. And then uh, the, these are the uh, small fans you can see. So if you pass uh, very close to these uh, swine farm, not very close, but maybe a few miles away, if you leave a few miles away from these swine barn, you can smell them. So they are very smelly. And uh, the manure, uh, they're colloidal, you know? So uh, uh, not easy to handle. And then, uh, and then they releases ammonia and H2S. And these gases are toxic at cert certain concentration. And at a specific time of a year, when they pump out to apply to the field, Mm, uh, these H2S gas uh, comes out as a bubbles and high concentration, and that can be like that can kill these animals and the workers. So there is a there is a health issue also, and uh, because of the low carbon nitrogen uh, ratios, that means they are very uh, very good nutrient source and very low carbon nitrogen ratio. That means the microbes can easily break them very easily, very good food source for the microbes. And upon application to the, uh, to the field, what happens, uh, we lost the, the carbon uh, that we had in the manure. And some uh, research also have found that um, they can actually break the native carbon. The, the soil gets so active that it can actually break the native carbon and lose it to the, to the atmosphere, uh, so, which, is, which is not good because we need a uh, good uh, like carbon uh, in the in the soil and uh, good uh, organic matter to have a better uh, soil quality and then uh, also the nitrogen and phosphorus they are mostly present in the plant available form and they can be lost from the soil before the plant can actually uh, accumulate in their and form form their biomass so uh, that means overall we lose uh, most of the nutrients and carbon uh, uh, to, to the atmosphere, to the environment, to the water bodies by the, by the surface runoff, by the uh, nitrification process or soil, different soil processes or microbial uh, actions or even spill. If, like if you spill manure and then it can get 
by any any chance if it gets to the water bodies that's not good because it's a high nutrient resource so now i'll be talking about little about biochar and um you now you know like it's a it's a carbonaceous uh, solid co-product of lignocellulosic biomass. What that means, like you have biomass, you pyrolyze it at, at any temperature by, uh, for example, fast pyrolysis, slow pyrolysis, or autothermal pyrolysis, like uh, Bernie said, like a little bit of oxygen. And then you end up with a biochar. And uh, I believe uh, in my case, uh, biochar surface area is very important. And uh, here is an SEM image, like it's 50 micron, which is like going to the very, very uh, close to the uh, to the biochar surface of a corn stover autothermal uh, biochar, and you can see the surface. So because of this high surface area, they are very good absorber of the gaseous uh, compounds or uh, even, even colloidal, colloidal uh, particles uh, from, for, for example, from manure. So uh, biochar is a soil amendment. It's a good soil amendment because it, it has high carbon to nitrogen ratio. That means what I said in case of manure, manure has low carbon to nitrogen ratio. And in biochar, we have high carbon to nitrogen ratio. That means microbes takes thousands of years to get that carbon to break and assimilate to the uh, completely to the atmosphere. It also also it depends on like uh, what kind of biomass we are using and and actually application of biochar to soil you build a carbon negative system and uh, because of the surface area porous nature they are absorber of gas liquid even uh, they are very good at heavy metal remediation heavy metal means uh, like copper zinc and uh, um, arsenic you know, those are the bad things uh, sometimes, like at, at a particular concentration, they can, could be bad for your, for your plant, for your soil. Biochar can uh, take care of those to some extent. And because of the carbon sequestering power, uh, application of biochar uh, can improve the soil organic matter, soil quality, overall soil quality. Okay. So, but biochar also has several issues. Uh, for example, Though it's a waste, and uh, but it is expensive. It's not like manure, uh, very very cheap. It's expensive. Also, it is difficult to transport as because it is flammable. You can see that picture. It's uh, I like that picture because you can see the the biochar particle is all over in the in the air. And if you work with biochar, and uh, if you do not have the uh, protection. Uh, uh, nose or your face is not covered, uh, then you can you can easily breathe in those uh, particles, uh, and then uh, that's not that's not good for your health also. And the biochar properties they varies with biomass or pyrolysis techniques you use, and that means to choose a biochar for your purpose, it's uh, it's complex, it's complicated. And then the uh, the surface charge uh, they vary uh, the biochar surface charge they vary a lot, and uh, and depending on the pyrolysis temperature and the biomass. So, but overall the biochar surfaces are mostly negative. So if you have a low temperature biochar, generally the biochar has more of the carboxylic uh, groups and they are negatively most sites are negatively charged. And then as you raise the temperature, uh, production temperature, you get, uh, uh, you get more of those uh, negative charge, uh, like not, not more uh, negative charge, but, uh, and few, few positive charge may be generated. So overall, it is a poor absorber of negative charge stuff like nitrate and phosphate. And whenever you apply, uh, uh, any 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 inorganic nutrient, uh, inorganic, for example, urea, and it gets into the form of nitrate. And uh, also, when you apply the manure itself, you have like in the manure you have ammonium, but when you apply that to soil, you can have transform that ammonium to nitrate and have a leaching loss. And similarly for phosphate, you have negatively charged phosphate. 
And uh, if the biochar if the biochar surfaces are mostly negative, that means you are losing that phosphate uh, very easily. So uh, the question came to me is like, uh, what would be what would happen if this biochar and swine manure get together? Like if we mix them, what will happen? Like what would be its quality, its properties? You know, as a researcher, that's that's very interesting question to me. So, and uh, from the from the department I work, uh, Devin Moore, uh, he published this paper where he applied wood biochar in manure storage to get. Uh, he he worked on the air quality enhancement uh, in the swine farms. So he applied that wood biochar in the in the manure, and he found that uh, you can reduce the emission of ammonia, H2S, like toxic gases, also the odorous compounds that comes from these, uh, from these uh, manure, you can reduce those significantly. And the application is economically feasible. However, this work doesn't talk anything about uh, its agronomic benefits or uh, like, uh, for example, if these, uh, if the uh, swine farmers are uh, applying this biochar uh, on manure and uh, for for to get rid of these uh, toxic gases and volatile compounds, and then when they pump that uh, manure out, now you have a mixture of biochar and manure. It's not only manure, so you have a different uh, different compound. Uh, so how that gonna behave if you apply that to your to your soil? Uh, if any, any any farmer they apply in the field, so can they go uh, in the field uh, as as soil amendments? So the hypothesis I had is yes, because when you apply that uh, biochar in the manure storage. And wet uh, um, and wet for some time, couple of months. You give the biochar a chance to absorb all these macro and micronutrients, even those colloidal particles. And then, um, and then, when you apply that uh, biochar manure mixture to the soil, you can actually make these uh, nutrient bioavailable or plant available, and uh, before. You lose that to the to the atmosphere, and as because the carbon, uh, the biochar carbon is not easily breakable, you might get uh, an increase in organic matter or or uh, even and improve the soil quality. So uh, I I did a small small study where I looked at the uh, the uh, quality of these. Uh, manure biochar mixture and then I use that manure biochar mixture uh, as a and did a nutrient leaching study uh, and then uh, also I looked at the plant growth and in the both uh, column leaching study and the plant growth at green in the greenhouse I looked at the soil quality parameter it's a small study but it gave me some background of how this uh, how this uh, mixture could 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 be uh, uh, could possibly be uh, be environmental uh, the impact on the environment actually. So I took uh, two kinds of biomass. One is red oak, uh, that is woody biomass, and then another is cornstover. Uh, uh, and then <coughs> the red oak was conventional uh, fast pyrolysis biochar, and the bi biochar came up with a pH of like seven. Uh, are uh, like almost neutral. And then the constover autothermal uh, biochar, uh, autothermal, it, it's a little bit of oxygen addition. And in conventional fast pyrolysis, that means no oxygen. So a little bit of oxygen actually raised the pH of the biochar. And uh, I call it uh, HAP. So now on, I will be using these uh, um, RO, HAP, these names rather than the whole name. And then the third biochar I use is the iron pretreated uh, 
autothermal phosphorylysis biochar. And then again, this biochar, because of the iron treatment, the, the pH drop to, to acidic range. And then I call it HAP-E biochar. And now on, I'll be using HAP-E. So to achieve that goal, uh, I used the, uh, I, I collected the swine manure from the Iowa State University Agricultural Farm. And I divided my, my uh, study into three experiments. The first experiment where I incubate the, the manure biochar. In the second experiment, I used uh, the, uh, I, I prepared soil columns using a typical Iowa soil and then just uh, did a leaching study. And in the third experiment, I used a greenhouse based pot study where I grow corn and soybean. As because in Iowa, we have mostly corn and soybean. That's why I chose those two plants just to, just to check like how, how, they be, how they grow under that condition. So in the experiment one, I use biochar to manure ratio at one is to four uh, because it's one of the preliminary study. And at this point, I don't know, uh, I didn't know like. Uh, what proportion would be good. So I use just one is to four, uh, wet by wet, and then incubate it for a month. So the left one is the swine manure, controlled swine manure after a month. And the right one is the uh, manure biochar mixture. Uh, so the left one, I can smell the manure. It's, it's like just manure, okay? But the right one, it's, it, you can see the texture completely changed. And I, I couldn't smell the, the manure at all. And uh, that, that voucher manure uh, mixture and the manure, they were stored uh, at zero uh, before, uh, before doing any analysis. And then we, we took those mixtures and manure and analyzed for the the basic studies like pH, nutrients, organic carbon, nitrogen, all this stuff. And uh, the in, because of the incubation, the, the mixture pH raised for two biochars. One is RO, that the red oak, and the, the, the HAP-E biochar, the iron pre-treated uh, constover biochar. The pH uh, increased by two units, that means the five the pH was uh, five, close to five, 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 one. That became like close to seven. And then the red oak had like seven and it, it shoot up to nine. But the, the HAP biochar, HAP, that's the constover biochar and uh, the, the manure, they had the same pH as nine. And then you saw in the previous picture that biochar absorb excess manure moisture and then very easy to handle. And the inorganic and organic nitrogen both increase in this biochar manure mixture than the biochar itself. And the P-phosphorus uh, that in the mixture drop than the manure. That means that biochar actually in the, the, the mixing because of the incubation, the, the phosphorus of the mixture went up uh, uh, and uh, then the biochar uh, itself. And overall, the CN ratio uh, dropped significantly than the biochar. Or in the other way, the manure, uh, manure uh, CN ratio went up. That means it's little difficult for microbes to break the, break the carbon of the mixture rather than if you apply manure itself. So in the experiment two, uh, we prepared some columns, like 15 columns. I'll, I have a picture in the next slide, so I will show you. And then uh, each column had like 250 gram of soil and it's more like research work. And so I have little more details than maybe you want to uh, take a note of, but we can, we can uh, talk about this in details if you need to know. And then what I did, I added water, a certain amount of like 50 ml of water, and I collected the leachate after, after eight, time, eight times of leaching, the colloidal material must have uh, gotten into the, into the pore space and the manure treated columns clogged. 
That means no water is coming out. That means it, the similar kind of thing could happen in the field also. Like, that means the long-term application of manure may end up with a stagnant field that is not good for, good for any plant to grow. And then the same soil after the leaching experiment, uh, we did several kinds of extraction of nutrients and also macro and macro, micronutrients. And also we did organic matter, pH, like all these uh, soil quality things, just to check like how these, uh, these soils would behave. So this is the, this is the uh, experimental setup I had with the columns. And then these are the five treatments I had, the manure control where I had soil columns and I added manure on, on top and use a spatula to just mix it, uh, the top th three centimeter of soil. And then for the soil control, I had only soil column. And uh, for the other mix of manure and biochar, I had MRO, MHAP and MHAP as I, as I described what they are in, the, in my previous slides. So uh, there was no significant change in nitrogen and ammonium loss in the, in the leachate. However, the M happy column was different. It had, uh, it had a lot more, uh, uh, significantly more uh, inorganic nitrogen total, 1.7 milligram per kilogram than the others, which means uh, the, the presence of uh, M hap E uh, actually uh, in, increase that uh, nitrate and ammonium transformation of that uh, uh, of that of those uh, menu nitrogen and then because of these uh, because of the, uh, the the application of these manure hap or manure uh, all this manure biochar mixture increase the organic matter than only manure application okay and then, but, but the CN ratio, the carbon to nitrogen ratio stayed the soil level. That means the soil had like the CN ratio of 10, which is like Iowa soil is very good quality soil, very like microbially very active soil. So the CN ratio 10 is very good. And when we have these uh, biochar manure mixture, uh, though the biochar has very high carbon, but Upon application with manure, uh, the, the CN ratio stayed within the soil level. And then uh, these are the some, some nutrient parameters. Uh, and then it shows that, uh, that phosphorus, the phosphorus, the manure had high phosphorus. And so plant available phosphorus, that means we can expect that this phosphorus can be lost to the to the, uh, by, by surface runoff. But if you look at the m happy, it has the lowest among these uh, biochar uh, manure mixture that the reason could be the iron. So uh, during the preparation of m happy, we had iron in it. And iron and phosphorus, they get, they are very good. Uh, they good, uh, like they, they make very good bonding, right? So, when I had phosphorus and uh, iron treated biochar, the, the plant available uh, or malic tree extractable uh, phosphorus dropped significantly than manure. In one sense, it is good if it doesn't uh, hamper the plant growth. That is my, my third experiment where I look at the, the plant growth and biomass. And then the nitrate and ammonium also showed that uh, these soil columns, uh, they have the, uh, the M happy columns, they have the highest uh, nitrate and ammonium. That's why maybe the leachates end up with a uh, little more, like little more nitrate and ammonium than the other treatments. However, when I looked at the copper and zinc, uh, this is interesting because the copper, it significantly dropped by M happy. I, uh, the other two biochar, they didn't show a uh, significant change in the manure, and, but uh, also zinc also, uh, it, it significantly dropped by the, the manure uh, biochar mixture than the manure application. In the experiment three, 
uh, I used like 40 pots and uh, 20 to grow uh, corn and 20 to grow uh, soybean. And these are the picture you can see and they grow quite well. And it, it was like two months of uh, total uh, experiment time. So it's not that uh, long. And uh, so I, I took the biomass uh, within, uh, within a few, few weeks. You can see the, see the, the picture, like they, they are not that, that uh, big. And then uh, after the biomass collection, I, I, I did the same like the soil quality parameters. And uh, I took the biomass and I, I dried those and looked at the, the yield, biomass yield. Also, I looked at the, uh, the malic three extractable nutrients for, for plants. Even in the plant biomass also, I looked at the nutrients, how, uh, if, if there is any difference between the nutrient uptake by these plants. So in terms of soil, uh, there is no, uh, for the soybean pods, there was no uh, nitrogen difference, but phosphorus, yes. The manure had the, uh, the highest malic tree or plant available phosphorus than the, uh, the manure biochar mixture application. And if, uh, among those, uh, the potassium also highest for the, the manure HAP E biochar. Again, the copper and zinc, uh, zinc, uh, military extractable copper zinc were low for these uh, manure, uh, manure uh, biochar mixtures rather than manure. And uh, this means that uh, probably these uh, manure biochar mixtures are good at holding these uh, copper and zinc uh, like, like elements. The corn pots are uh, soils were a little different in terms of nitrogen. So uh, the, the manure nitrate was the highest. And then uh, the manure biochar mixture, they had, uh, they had significantly low, uh, low nitrate concentration, which is good. That means upon uh, on application of manure biochar, actually we can reduce the nitrate leaching loss. The ammonium didn't show any significant difference. Again, the phosphorus was low for the M happy. It could be again for the for the iron presence of iron could have made this uh, less uh, available phosphorus for the plant at this point because they were little, so they don't need that much phosphorus in the soil to have. The uh, the corn pot soils also showed a similar impact on corn and uh, copper and zinc. They were low uh, than the manure. So again, we this is good uh, because uh, if they don't hamper the plant growth, if you have less heavy metals, then I think it's good to to my to my point of view. Then when I looked at the soil quality, none of the pot. Uh, had any raise in pH, although the mixture had the pH of uh, nine uh, for uh, for MRO and uh, MHAP biochars, but uh, the soil pH got neutralized, and then the organic matter significantly increased for the biochar manure mixture, not for the manure. Okay, and the CN ratio of control was like in between 10, 10.5. Control means but for both like soil and manure uh, applied to soil. But when it come, came to the, the biochar manure treatments, the ratio, CN ratio was little high, 11 and in between 11 and 13. But uh, I think like it's, it's not, it, it may not hamper the microbial activity that much. So uh, it should be, shouldn't be a problem for the soil quality that that to that extent. And when I looked at the biomass yield at that short experiment, treatment had no impact on the biomass yield, okay? And then uh, the nutrient uptake by the plants, they also not statistically different. Although like the copper, zinc, they were low under the uh, biochar manure mixture. But when we looked at the, the plant, the copper, zinc, they were not significantly different. That means in, if you consider them as micronutrient, 
uh, we are not hampering the micronutrient availability. And if you consider them as heavy metals, then you can say like, okay, there, there was a uh, heavy metal reduction by the biochar application with the, with the manure. So uh, from these three studies, uh, I conclude like this biochar swine manure mixture, they have some, they have agronomic benefits. So, and this biochar manure mixture can be, can increase the uh, soil carbon organic matter without hampering the soil pH and pH is important uh, for this nutrient uh, availability, right? And then the iron modification of the biochar surface can impact on the uh, malic-3 extractable phosphorus, which is a plant available phosphorus. And then the, we can reduce the uh, heavy metal uh, related issues that manure application could have uh, in the soil by, by using this biochar. But, but uh, as these experiments are very short term, so long-term field experiments are warranted. Before, uh, before we can say any environmental impact on long-term basis. But these short studies, they came out wonderful. And with that, I would like to uh, thank the uh, Leopold Center uh, for Sustainable Agriculture, Iowa State University for providing the fund and uh, all the professors, my colleagues and graduate and undergrad students to help me uh, finishing this project. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for listening to me. And I would like to have any questions you may have. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chunky. Um, fascinating research you are doing with um, biochar and manure. Um, if you go to the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, hopefully. OK. Um, there, there are a few questions that have come in. Um, if you start, if you scroll to the top, and you work your way down, could answer those. Okay, Q and A. Okay, would wood butcher and poultry or cattle manure mature mixture also be a great quality for fruit crop and crop production? Uh, I think like uh, it depends on uh, like for example poultry and cattle manure. The, the problem or uh, issues that I had with the swine manure uh, was, the, uh, uh, for example, the, the moisture and the, uh, the odor that I started with, but they end up with very good uh, product. I believe for poultry and cattle manure also, it should work because in poultry manure, uh, there are problems related to heavy metals. So I believe uh, it, it will, uh, the barger will definitely help uh, those kind of stuff. And even, even the, uh, but, the, but the carbon nitrogen ratio, that, that might also helpful because cattle manure, they also have like uh, relatively a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. So if you mix the, uh, mix the uh, biochar, so that might uh, improve the uh, the soil quality, and because it will store the carbon for very uh, for longer time. That means you are building soil carbon. And then, can you please inform about the level of phosphorus in biochar manure mixture? Okay, the biochar manure mixture. Uh, I don't remember. I have to. I don't remember the value, but. Uh, I have to check the data. I don't remember. Sorry about that. Maybe maybe that individual could follow up with you separately. Yes, um, yes, if they yes, have that. sure, sure. Okay. And the, the work will be published very soon because it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, under under review and uh, actually we are positive it will be it will be published very soon. So uh, I can even uh, I can share the the paper also with the person. And then uh, is the production of barger economically uh, scalable to keep pass with pig manure production in Iowa to solve some of the issue created by that much manure applied uh, to the agricultural field? Uh, I, I think so, I think so. Because, uh, because uh, I, the, although I use the, the barger manure mixture, I use like one is to four ratio weight by weight, but I believe uh, the ratio can be can be 
that, that is like the, this is very early stage of these experiments. So uh, there are more, uh, more uh, work to be done on these kind of studies, like uh, specifically like what, what ratio is the best for these, uh, for these uh, amendments. So yes, that is important to, to consider, but I believe we can, we can uh, make it economically feasible. Yes. What would happen if you cooked the manure with mix of feedstock? or mix the manure with the biochar and cook it. Perhaps it's a variety of temperature. Yes, uh, you can definitely cook it, but again, if you, when you have a temperature, that means you are putting energy, that means it's cost. Uh, we just wanted to have like a cost efficient, so biochar, it's a, a solid co-product of these lignosolulosic biomass and Bioeconomy Institute, they're actually producing uh, bio oils and then uh, this barger is a waste. So that means, and, and the, the manure is a waste. So I wanted to have something from the waste and I don't want it to uh, increase the cost by, by cooking that further. But uh, yes, but when you cook them, you might end up with a little different product and then uh, more research or studies needed just to know like how, 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 how they, they will behave. And I believe uh, they, they should behave well in the soil because you are improving the soils, soil organic matter and carbon status. Can you say anything about the urine versus manure, both with biochar, of course. Okay, so uh, the, the study I did is swine manure. So in the peats, you, you, you don't see the urine or manure uh, separately, right? So the, the, in the peats, the urine and manure, they get together. Right, but the urine also. If you, for example, if you uh, soak it in the biochar, uh, you are adding nitrogen. Maybe not much carbon, but nitrogen because urine is a good source of nitrogen. And then when you mix it in the biochar, maybe you are soaking uh, uh, more nitrogen in that biochar. Uh, it may not end up with a buildup of uh, organic matter that much, but uh, it might be a little better than. A, a, application of urine because biochar will also take care of the, the odorous emission of, from the urine. Will you have similar results if you use slow pyrolysis biochar? Uh, that's, that's a good question also. Uh, yes, uh, if you have slow, here it's, it's more like, I, I didn't concentrate on the, on the fast pyrolysis or so slow pyrolysis. I, I took the first pyrolysis because that's the waste they're producing so that's why I consider the first pyrolysis, but slow pyrolysis may, may behave a little differently, but in terms of uh, organic matter uh, or in terms of uh, nutrient absorption, they, they should, uh, they should uh, work because here I, I consider like the biochar surface porosity and the surface charge. Uh, slow pyrolysis and first pyrolysis, they are a little different in terms of functional groups and uh, little uh, behavior is different. But in this case, they might work because here we have the manure, which is a good nutrient source and barger as an absorber of that nutrient. I see that based on your finding application of barger from the point of nutrient retention, especially in the form of nitrate, ammonium and phosphate from manure is not much useful. Do you recommend, uh, I didn't get you. I see that based on your finding application of biochar, oh, untreated from the point of nutrient retention, especially in the form of nitrate, ammonium, phosphate from manure the, is not. The question continues slightly further. Um, into oh, okay. Sorry, the question continued. So do you generally recommend its use in combination of manure to increase crop yield and retain nutrients? Yes, so yes, that, that is what the research is about. Like when you have the, uh, the manure and voucher, and then uh, at the beginning of the experiment, when it, your, your nitrate ammonium phosphates, they could be uh, in a different form, but with time, if you can have this nitrogen and phosphorus stored in the, in the, in the system, as, as application of biochar manure, you are improving the organic matter. That means improving probably the, the microbial activity. 
if you can make these nitrogen phosphorus uh, to organic form, that means they will stay in the soil uh, longer than the inorganic forms. And that means that with longer term, you can, uh, you can have like the better, better soil quality. Uh, like in, in short term, maybe you see a picture that may not last in the long term. But in this case, I believe like as we are seeing the organic matter improvement and the, the nitrogen uh, improvement in the, in, the, in the mixture, which means it, it may last for longer than the, the inorganic forms of these nitrogen and phosphorus. Is there a risk of harboring and increasing pathogens when combining biochar and manure? I think you are actually reducing the, the pathogen uh, activity because uh, when, uh, when you have the biochar as a good sorbent, these pathogen, uh, like I don't have the data. So it's, it's my personal, uh, personal uh, impact, like what you question. So maybe it, it, there are studies where it shows like the antibiotic activity uh, reduces when you have the biochar in soil. So in the same, same way, it, it may, may help actually the plant to grow in, in, in like the pathogens, they, the biochar could actually resist this pathogen activity and uh, improve the, improve the, uh, the crop, crop uptake of these, these nutrients. Cost improvements for all actors. <laughs> yes, that's the main theme, yes. So the cost is always important. So uh, I, I hope like uh, we can reduce the amount of biochar and in increase the amount of manure because manure is, uh, manure is cheap. So if we get that sweet point where we can have the, uh, we can have the nutrient availability uh, less uh, to the at atmosphere or environment, more to the plant and maintain that sweet uh, ratio, uh, we can definitely reduce the cost. 